I want to remind us what we've done in looking at Kant's theory. We've examined two formulas primarily. The formula of universal law that says act only on that maxim you can at the same time will as a universal law. And also the formula of humanity that says you should treat humanity always as an end in itself, never as a means only, never merely as a means. If you put those two together, you get a certain picture. And as we've seen, he thinks one of them gives you an argument for the other. That if you judge things on the basis of universal considerations, there is one thing that all rational agents value and respect, and on which he thinks actually their dignity rests, which is their ability to make rational decisions, their rational agency. And so all rational agents have to respect rational agency. Well, if we put these ideas together, we say, all right, we've got two ideas, two concepts. One is the concept of universal law. We have to be able to universalize our moral judgments. Can't make exceptions for me or other people we like or my group or that type of thing. And the second thing is that we have to respect people. We mustn't use them. We mustn't manipulate them. We can't deceive them. Um, we cannot coerce them. Okay, we have to respect their moral agency. Now, so far, one you could say, well, what does this mean in organizations? Last time we talked a lot about the universality and the fact that we can't discriminate on the basis of irrelevant considerations of a variety of kinds. This one indicates something that includes that, but also gives you a sense of something more. Uh, what would it be like to treat someone with disrespect? without discriminating necessarily, but nevertheless treat that person disrespectfully. Treat them as a mere means. Yeah. Okay, lying to them. So the same things, right? I'm deception. We could say, look at the conditions for rational agency. Somebody has to have information. So if I deceive them, if I lie to them, or if I just withhold important information, that they need to make a rational decision, then you might say, I'm exploiting them. I'm using them merely as a means. Uh, another way, if I'm coercing them, I'm doing something to force you into something, that would constitute treating you with disrespect. Is there anything beyond those? There are some Kantians who say, that's it. Just don't deceive people, don't coerce them. But is that all there is to it? Yeah. Good example. Suppose you plagiarize somebody's work, right? That would be a case. You're not deceiving them. You're not coercing them. Um, maybe you're deceiving your reader. <laughs> but in any event, your reader might not even care whether you are the or origin of this idea or somebody else's. Nevertheless, you might think there's something wrong here. You're not just maybe using your reader. You're using the person merely as a means who actually came up with the idea, who actually wrote this in the first place. And so plagiarism feels like it's uh, using someone who isn't even maybe aware of this, right? It doesn't require that the person even know about this. Can you think of other examples where somebody is really taking advantage of someone else, but with, without coercion, without deception? Yeah. Ah, all right, there's a lot about respect. And if we think in terms of those relationship types that we studied a few weeks ago, we can say, aha, uh -huh, wait a minute, there's a lot to respect that has to do with the particular relationship type. And so if I do not address someone with the properly respectful title, I do not refer to the Duchess as your highness <laughs> or whatever, I do not refer to uh, anybody, I mean, it might be my doctor. Right? Um, if I don't treat the person in the way that the relationship suggests they ought to be treated, then you might think that I'm treating them with disrespect, even though there's no coercion or deception involved. Um, for example, students are often puzzled about how to refer to professors. Um, it's, it's like a weird question, because it's not really that you want to treat someone with disrespect. It's like, what's respectful in this context? 
And it's not agreed upon in a way, um, right? It's, a, it's an awkward thing. I went to a Quaker college where, you know, it's kind of a thing to refer to people by their first names. But it felt very strange to just, you know, ask my professor a question in class and say, hey, Dick, I don't understand. <laughs> and, but I felt like it was strangely formal to refer to him as professor or doctor or something. And so the, the solution we all came up with is we never referred to our professor at all. <laughs> I mean, you just hoped to be noticed, right? You didn't use any form of address, whatever. Um, and and that, that's rather awkward. Um, and in different contexts, different things matter. I mean, in a lot of contexts, it bugs me if somebody uses just my last name. If they use just my first name, that's fine. But just my last name feels familiar in a way that I dislike. On the other hand, um, you know, it does depend on the context. If the newspaper were referring to me, not that that's really ever happened. <laughs> but if it were, um, I would expect them to use my last name and not to just say Dan said blah, 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 right? So, so anyway, it's kind of strange. And something similar happens with names that can be abbreviated, like Daniel or Dan, um, Kenneth, Ken, etc. cetera. Um, different, oh, say? Dr. B. Dr. Yeah, Dr. B, that doesn't bother me at all. Um, actually, yeah, my junior high school students used to refer to me as Dr. Dan, that was getting on the borderline. Uh, but anyway, there were things that, yeah, how can I put it? Um, often we are called one thing as a child, right? And maybe another thing in high school, and then as an adult you want to be called something different. And there are weird dynamics about this. One of my best friends in print calls me Dan, and yet in person calls me Daniel. For most people, it's exactly the opposite, right? In, in person, they call me Dan, unless they've known me since like a long time ago, in high school or earlier, in which case they call me Danny. But there aren't many of those left. <laughs> not, I, not that I've killed them all or anything. I mean, <laughs> I've just moved all over the place and so on. But anyhow, that, you know, to use the wrong term for somebody like that, even though somebody you know well in a kind of equality matching relationship can be weird. So I think you're right to say, there are certain things about the roles, about the specific relationships, that don't have to do with coercion, they don't have to do with deception, but do involve a kind of respect within the context of that relationship. And one set of rules applies to the authority ranking type relationship that you had in mind. Another set of rules applies to friendships and equality matching relationships and so on. Uh, a, a different set of rules applies when you're dealing with market pricing relationships, if you are, I don't know, waiter, waitress, um, shopkeeper, or something like that, you know, how do you refer to a customer? Um, and it may depend on the kind of shop. At a certain kind of shop, it will be Mr. Jones, and another one will be, hey, dude. <laughs> so it depends. Um, and that does make this kind of slippery. Part of what it is to learn about that relationship in that social situation is to understand that kind of form that respect takes within that. So anyway, I think that's a crucial thing. And within any given organization, there are going to be informal practices about this. Um, if I go in and talk to the dean, how do I refer to him? Um, if Actually, that, it's a very easy question if I don't know the dean. But if we were friends for a long time before he became dean, now suddenly it's like, oh, you know. <laughs> uh, what do I do? What do I say about that? So anyway, these things can be tricky in many cases. Any other ways in which you might think you could express disrespect without coercion, without deception? Yeah. Uh, if you were in a group project, you just didn't do your share. Ah, good. You didn't do your share, right? You've got a group project you're working on together. You each take a part of it. You don't do your part. You might say, look, that was disrespectful toward the others. Um, now. Did it involve coercion? No. Did it involve deception? Well, maybe if you promised to do it. Um, but on the other hand, it might be that it wasn't really deception. Nobody officially promised anything. You simply had this. May, in fact, maybe a group leader just said, hey, you know, um, we'll all work on all the parts, you know, but, but it'd be great if you could start on this and start on that, and you just don't do it. Um, they might interpret that as disrespectful, even if there was no real promise made. Um, 
we're going to get to those type of group projects later um, in game theory. And as we'll see, it's actually really hard to structure a group in such a way that people have an incentive to do their part. <laughs> yeah? Perhaps uh, free writing in general? Yeah, free writing in general feels like that. The person who goes into the subway and hops over the turnstile. It feels like they're, in a sense, using the system, right? Or the person who manages to sneak on the bus without paying the fare. Um, it feels as if those people are taking advantage of the system, we would often say. Because there, it's hard to pinpoint one specific person who's being shown disrespect. You almost get the sense, though, that everybody who's using the system properly is shown disrespect. You feel like a chump while you're there paying for your seat while somebody else just cheats their way onto it. And you might feel the same way about someone who cheats on an exam, let's say. Maybe they are partly deceiving the professor, but it's not just that. It might be felt by other students to be disrespectful, because you might think, wait, why am I doing this honestly while you're cheating your way to this? And all sorts of cheating, whether it's in an academic context or a business context or whatever, can feel that way. You feel like a chump for playing the game by the rules. Yeah. Ah, good, breaking propriety. So it's not just forms of address or things like that. There are, in general, rules of propriety that are broader than moral rules. And you might think respect encompasses all of those. So there's a way of reading Kantian ethics where it's very specifically moral. But you could say, really, this concept of respect is much larger than that. And go back to that example of walking into somebody's shop. Um, and think about it point from the point of view of the customer showing respect for or disrespect for the owner of the shop. Um, it's not just a question of what you say to them. It's a question of how you behave, what you do. Um, and you can imagine all sorts of inappropriate behavior that would constitute disrespect for that shop and its owner. So I think that's a great point. This is something that feels like it goes far beyond just specific things about deception or coercion or something like that. It really has to do with appropriate behavior in general. OK, well, if we think about those things, we can say these set bounds on our behavior, right? They set boundaries. And you might think that that's really the purpose of Kantian ethics, to say you can't make exceptions for yourself. You can't treat people with disrespect. But now, is there anything more to it than that? What about helping people? What about the person who needs help? Are you required to help them? You haven't made a promise. You're, this isn't part of a group project or something. The person has slipped and fallen. And they can't get up. They're hurt. And they say, please help me. Um, and you say, eh, sucks to be you, <laughs> and walk on. <laughs> um, that, now, does that show them disrespect? Uh, Kant would say, yes, it does. But you can get the sense, wait, there are two senses of disrespect going on here, right? One is a sense where you are really uh, under some obligation, whether it's a rule of propriety or something specific to the relationship or something very general about rational agency. You, are, you have some responsibility. You have some obligation. But what about this case where it looks like I'm not using them merely as a means? Suppose I just don't acknowledge them at all. And in fact, that happens all the time. Somebody falls down and collapses out here in the hallway. Does everybody in the hallway go rush over to help? No. In fact, the more people that there are in the hall hallway, the less likely it is that any individual person is going to help. And so you might think, wait, uh, what are my obligations here? Well, Kant says, I have an obligation to not just not, you might say, <laughs> deny someone rational agency. I have to make my actions harmonize with it. And that means I have to take on their ends as my own. In fact, he puts it really strongly. He says, I don't want to just maintain humanity. I, just, I have to advance it. The ends of any subject who is an end in himself ought, as far as possible, be my ends also. Well, that's kind of a that's a remarkable claim, right? I have to take on your end. So you've fallen down and you want to get up. I have to help you up. But how far does this go? 
Yeah. Could you also think of it in terms of the universal law aspect? Like, I would want someone to help me if I fall, therefore I am obligated to help them, because otherwise it's no, it's not a universal. That okay, good. Yes, you might say, wait, I as a rational agent facing this impediment would want somebody to help me. And in fact, I would see it as necessary for the fulfillment of my agency, right? I, I'm trapped, I can't do this, help me. And so, yes, um, I apply the universal law and think I would want that. And indeed, when he presents this argument, he says, that's why. Look, I am going to frequently need the love and sympathy of others, and so I'm gonna need help, so I better help others. Um, and all of that makes a certain kind of sense. But now, to what extent do I have to go to take your ends on as my own. So, you are seeking to know something about organizational ethics. I am supposed to take that end on as my own, right? Because I'm your professor. Um, but suppose you have a hobby on the side. You say, well, I also collect stamps. Do I have to take that end on as my own? Do I have to say, oh, I'll, I'll help you collect stamps? <laughs> or suppose you, I don't know, one of my nephews has this goal of climbing every high mountain in New Hampshire, um, every mountain over 4,000 feet or something. There are dozens of them. Um, and he's done all but one or two. Well, do I have to take that end on as my own? I'm not gonna climb mountains in New Hampshire. Um, I mean, I've done it a few times, and, but it's not a passion of mine. And if so I find, hey, you've only done this with one or two. What about, what about Menadnock? It's like, I don't know, Menadnock leaves me cold. I have no particular, well, not just literally, I have no desire really to get to the top of every mountain. Should I take that on as my own? Or should I take on his doing it? It's like, I have to help him somehow? It's like, oh, I'll drive you up there again? What are the limits of this? Yeah. Oh, okay, well good, let's see what happens if we reverse it. Because you're right, he says it's very important. What gives us dignity is our autonomy, our ability to make decisions for ourselves and lay down the law for ourselves. So we want to allow people as much autonomy as we can, consistently with respecting the autonomy of others. But now let's see if we can flip that around. Does that mean, well what would it look like flipped around in a positive way? I have to take on your ends as if they were my own to the extent that it doesn't interfere with my pursuit of my own ends. Maybe that. So I have to help you as much as I can without getting in the way of what I'm trying to do. That would be one way of interpreting this. After all, if I'm really to serve the advancement of humanity, the advancement of our rational natures, then you could say, I am supposed to help you attain what you want to the extent that it doesn't interfere with what I am doing. Now, that would be one interpretation, I think. So you might say, if we think about this helping, this uh, harmonizing business, taking on the ends of others as my own, you might say, well, here's one way of looking at it. I should do this as much... <laughs> as I can without interfering with my pursuit of my own, own ends. And I'm just gonna borrow a term from Jean-Paul Sartre here to help us shorten that. <laughs> interfering with my projects. After all, I do structure various activities towards some goal. Let's just call that a project. So I have certain projects. I should help you with your projects as long as it doesn't interfere with my projects. Now that's still really demanding. Hey, what are you doing on Saturday night? Well, nothing in particular. Uh-oh, you're gonna ask me to do something and now I have to do it, morally speaking, right? Because I don't really have anything else going on. Uh, so you might think this is still gonna kind of be burdensome, yeah. Could you argue, and I think that this, this is very slippery, it's a kick you out of doing anything. But, ah, right. Uh, by you not having free time on Saturday night or whatever, it burns out later on and that's the way you can ruin your own progress. 
Okay, good. You could say, hey, my project is relaxing, right? My, my project for Saturday night is recharging my batteries. Uh, <laughs> that's a perfectly legitimate thing to do. And in fact, the older you get, the more you value time when there are no demands on you. It's like, so what do I have to do? Nothing. Awesome. <laughs> okay, so yeah, there's a real value to that sort of project of like not doing anything. Yeah. <clears throat> Oh, well, good, good point. Okay, there are two things here. One is, yes, wait a minute, you have a lot of projects going on, right? And so what time, often you're in a situation where, hey, what are you doing for the next hour? Well, I don't have specific plans for the next hour, but it's not like if you hadn't asked me to help you, I would have been sitting there in some kind of zen state just going, uh, I mean, probably. I, I did once make the mistake of taking a Benadryl because my allergies were bothering me a lot before I went to work. Um, now I know, don't take them during the day. <laughs> uh, because I found myself just sitting in my office and looked at the clock and realized I had been sitting there for 45 minutes staring at the wall. <laughs> and it was not a Zen-like meditation. Well, maybe it was, I don't know. Maybe it's the one time I achieved perfect <laughs> Satori was, you know, Benadryl. Just like, what was going on here? Nothing, I think. Uh, <laughs> but normally, that's not, you, you would have been thinking about something, doing something, reading something, working on something, maybe just relaxing. Whatever it was, you would have been advancing one of your projects. So you might argue, look, isn't something else always kind of interfering? The second point, though, is there are lots of people who would like help, you know? So imagine that you just say, hey, I have Saturday free. Anybody need help with anything? Maybe you'll be lucky and nobody will respond. But maybe you put this out there on social media and suddenly thousands of people do this. It's kind of like saying, hey, you know what? I've decided it's my obligation to help people in need. I'm going to pass $100 bills out on the street corner on Saturday morning. You know, a lot of people are going to show up. <laughs> a lot more than you can afford to give $100 bills to. So you might think, wait, I don't know if this is on one extreme, it feels like maybe this commits me to nothing. On the other extreme, it's like maybe this commits me to, I don't know, helping the whole world with all sorts of things. This is tough. So that's one way of looking at this. Is there any alternative way? One way would be to say, well, look, I have to help people with things that are intrinsic to their rational agency. There are things that are ends of all rational agents. Namely, for example, <laughs> their rationality, their ability to develop their own capacity for rational agency. But there are other things that are their own private ends. And so do I have to help you collect stamps? No. Do I have to help you further your rational agency? Yes. So you want to learn how to do something? I, it really is my obligation to teach you if I know how to do it. Um, you want help with something that will help enlarge your capacities for rational action, then yes, I should do that because it's the kind of thing I should do for any rational agent at all. But the specific private ends, whether it's climbing mountains or collecting stamps or I don't know, whatever it is, I don't have to help you with that. You say, hey, I've got this goal of going to every live music performance in Austin I can possibly get to. And somebody's playing at the Nutty Brown Cafe and I have no way of getting there. Will you drive me? I don't have to say yes. Okay, even if I'm not doing anything else. Because, look, that doesn't really further your rational agency. Um, I mean, maybe it could. Maybe it's like, wait, I, I have an audition with this band next week, and I gotta hear them before I get, so I know what they do. Okay, then maybe I should help you. But otherwise, no, I don't have to take on those private goals. So a second interpretation would be to say, Look, they're the ones that are essential to rational agency. Those are the ones I have to help you with. But all the private stuff, that's different. That's your thing. That's not something I have to help you with. So you've fallen and can't get up, 
or you're drowning and need somebody to save you, yeah, I really do have an obligation to help. Any rational agent would have that obligation toward any rational agent. But if it's a question of collecting stamps or climbing mountains or going to hear that band, et cetera, I don't have to help you with that. Yeah? Ooh, how do you choose who to help? Good, lots of people need help. Um, I want you to imagine for a moment that you're Bill Murray in, <laughs> not just in general, um, in Groundhog Day, <laughs> okay? And you're living the same life over and over again. At one point, somebody asked the director, so how long did you imagine this all taking? And the answer was something like 10,000 years to finally get past this day. But in any event, so you're going through this again and again, and you get this mission, finally, you realize, my goal here should be to help people. And so you try to save the kid falling out of the tree, and you help the guy choking in the restaurant, and all of this stuff. But now, how do you decide who to help? There are a lot of people. And actually, in the movie, he tries to help the old man who dies, and he finally realizes, yeah, I can't do that. The guy is going to die no matter what I do. And so he gives up on that one, but ends up having the time to help these old ladies with their flat tire and a variety of other things. Anyway. The whole idea would be, look, okay, if you're stuck in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania <laughs> for one day, maybe there are only a certain number of things you can actually help with. But in the whole world at large for the rest of your life, there's an overwhelming number of problems you can help with, right? And a huge number of them have to do with things essential to rational agency, things about saving lives or about at least improving lives tremendously. Malaria kills a lot of people, for example, but it also just damages a lot of people in a way that harms their rational agency. So you could say, wow, maybe I should devote the rest of my life to trying to help people avoid malaria, to cure malaria, to eliminate malaria. Or maybe you, you know, but why that, right? There are many, many things. And so it could feel overwhelming, even if we restrict it to that. Well, part of the reason I go through this is to say, that in organizations, it's one thing to say there are certain boundaries. Treat people with respect. Don't make exceptions for yourself. Um, not just in organizations, of course, in society at large, too. But then we ask, well, what is it to contribute? What are, your, what are the expectations on you to not just do your own work without harming the work of others, but actually to help other people with their work? And it can be hard to say what those expectations are. It's hard to know. So what is it to be a good citizen, a good departmental citizen, or a good, good corporate citizen, or a good, um, I don't know, a good worker in a nonprofit agency, or something like that, or just a good team player? What's, what are your obligations? You might think, yeah, I want to be a good team player. I want to really be involved and committed and help other people. But what does that mean exactly? What do you have to do? So let's reflect on that for a moment. What is it to be a good team player, whatever that team happens to be? Yeah. Um, I guess to uh, make a sense of the team, you want to be efficient, like know your role, um, not be burdensome, but also like help others to the extent that, that you're able to. So if you can uh, take care of your part easier or direct others, OK, well, that sounds a lot like this first one, actually, <laughs> right? In the sense that, look, you're supposed to do your own thing, but insofar as you can, help others with what they're doing. Now, notice it doesn't necessarily mean, well, just any and all comers. Maybe lots of people need help, um, but you're going to be a lot more qualified to help some people than others. And so maybe a friend of mine in the chemistry department is overwhelmed and really needs help grading chemistry homeworks. I could volunteer to help. But I'm not of much use. You know, I did take AP chemistry in high school. That was the extent of my chemical background. So my ability to do this is going to be very limited. And you might think, yeah, you know, look, don't go messing around and trying to help where you're not competent to help. <laughs> but be selective. The places you can do most good, maybe you should try to do that good. Yeah. Be good and then we 
will figure it out after having that problem. Ah, well, that's an interesting point. I should be supportive, right? Maybe I can't do it, but I should be supportive. So, for example, um, let's go back to the case of the, the nephew who's climbing the mountains in New Hampshire. I don't have to help him. I don't have to do it, but I might, be, I might have to be supportive. I might have to be encouraging, right? He tells me his goal is to climb all these mountains. I don't say, oh, that's so stupid. <laughs> right? I don't do that. I am, I am supportive. Even if, I, I mean, actually, I don't think it's stupid, but if I did think it's stupid, still, I'm not supposed to say that. I keep that to myself, and I say, you know, oh, how interesting. <laughs> or whatever people do when they're polite and want to be supportive without believing in it at all. But yes, we can be really trapped <laughs> into situations where it's like, ooh, what kind of advice do I give? Am I frank? Uh, you know, or do I act supportive even when I privately think it's insane and you're really harming yourself? Um, and and that's, a, that's a delicate thing. Sometimes somebody has to let you know. I mean, I've occasionally asked people for advice. They'll say, oh, yeah, that's great. I say, well, if you just say it's great, I don't get better. Tell me what I can do better. And then I get all these suggestions. And then I find, oh. I'm a, I'm like, ah, <laughs> okay, you actually had a lot of criticism, a lot to say. Um, and sometimes you can spin it that way if you want this to say, look, I want you to tell me the truth, so please, I got to tell you, tell me the truth. <laughs> Don't tell me what you think I want to hear. But, um, but yeah, it's delicate. And sometimes when I grade student papers, I have faced that dilemma. Luckily, not with any of you because you're all very good. Um, but in the past, sometimes people turn in garbage. And then, and often it's a student I think is actually a good student, but nevertheless it's garbage. And some of the best professors, or the best moments I had as a student, were actually the least pleasant at the time, because a professor just said, yeah, this, this stinks, man, you gotta do better. And it's never fun to hear, but it helped me get better. Yeah. But yeah, oh, well, very good. Being straightforward in a nice way. Yeah, I mean, the worst thing to do is to be disdainful openly and so on. That really does seem to reflect a disrespect. Not only is like this bad work, but I don't have any respect for you as a person. Um, you have to try to convey that respect at the same time. Now, after a while, people get attuned to this. It's like, look, I, I think you're really very good, but, you know, like, uh, now be very afraid, right? <laughs> uh, I would fear it less if you didn't feel the need to say you're good at this, but, um, but still, I think you're right. Often you have to somehow convey the message that, no, this, this isn't right. This has to, you know, this needs to be improved without showing disrespect for the person or indicating that you don't respect their rationality. Yeah. But well, that's a good point. You, you might say, look, to some extent the market corrects for this kind of thing, although people can devote a lot of time and effort and money to something pointless. Um, on the other hand, you're talking to a philosophy professor who went to and got a PhD in philosophy in the 1970s when the job market in academia was terrible, uh, as much as it is today. And, and so I knew at the time, look, this is kind of a long shot, but I also figured, well, I'm young and you know, I got plenty of time, and my, you know, to some extent, I was just cocky. Like, well, you go to the best possible place, you just emerge as like one of the best possible people out of that place. And if you find that you're not able to do that, don't do it. And so, I found that was my strategy: just be 
the best person at the best place. You know, we fought. <laughs> um, but, and that's, that's a pretty good strategy in a way, actually. For graduate schools, I often tell people that. Look, if you can get into a top 10 place, go. Okay? If you can't, maybe a top 20 place if you're going to work in an area where they're strong. If you can't do that, don't go. Don't do it. Now, that's a little too strong. There are programs that are very good for more specialized things, and or either more specialized topics, or they tend to get jobs for their people doing a specific kind of thing in a specific area of the country. And if you say, hey, I'm happy doing that, fine. Um, but yeah, there are certain degrees where a few people are going to end up in positions that are their dream jobs, and then most people aren't. And if you know that going in and just say, yeah, the odds are against me, but I'm going to do it anyway, okay, give it a shot. But have a backup plan. <laughs> uh, that's my, my sort of view. Make sure you're working with a net under you. Okay, well, we're wasting a lot of time here. So let me get to where this is actually going. The last version of this formula that I really want to focus on is the formula of the kingdom of ends. It is one of the most puzzling things in Kant's ethics, I think. He says very little about it. And there's a huge amount of scholarly disagreement about how to interpret what he does say. So let's take a look at the kingdom of ends. The Reich der Zwecke is the way it is in German. And the word Reich just means kingdom or realm. Um, it's often these days translated as the realm of ends. Um, but this is one of the works that Hitler read when he was imprisoned after the Munich Beer Hall Putsch. Um, and I wonder whether his idea of the Third Reich came in part from this Reich zur Zwecke. Um, so after that, it, this, the term in German has a little bit of a scary connotation. Um, and according to some scholars, that's actually, it should. But let's get to that in a moment. Anyway, here is the idea. He says, by a kingdom, I understand the union of different rational beings in a system by common laws. If we abstract from the personal differences of rational beings, and likewise from all the content of their private ends, we shall be able to conceive all ends combined into a systematic whole, including both rational beings as ends in themselves and also the special ends which each may propose to himself. That is to say, we can conceive of a kingdom of ends, which on the preceding principles is possible. What is this? It is a systematic union of rational beings by common objective laws. Now, this is a kingdom of ends where we've got um, a systematic union. of rational beings by common objective laws. Now, what does he mean by this? <clears throat> what exactly does this require? He says, look, it's only an ideal. But a rational being belongs to uh, the kingdom of ends when, although giving universal laws in it, he's also subject to the laws. He belongs to it as a sovereign when, while giving laws, he's not subject to the will. But the point is everybody is subject to these laws. They're universal. So a rational being must always regard himself as giving laws, as a member of sovereign, as a kingdom of ends. Now, that's what we're supposed to do. So imagine yourself as a legislator who is also subject to the very same legislation. That's how you're to think of everything you do. Imagine that you are, in doing this, not only laying down the rule for yourself, but for everyone in this systematic whole. Well, OK. Um, to some extent, then, this is capturing the idea of universal law once again. But what do we mean by the systematic union? Just as we saw there were different interpretations about what was required of us here, there are different interpretations of this. So one interpretation which is, is to say, look, we have to unite our private ends. He says at one point, abstracting away from the private ends. But then he says, well, including them too. So we have some ends. I'm going to draw it this way. Here's the ends we have in common as rational beings. And then you might say, we all have these private ends in addition. 
and they might overlap. Some of yours might be also mine and so on. But we have this realm of private ends out here. <laughs> and all of these private ends, well, what's supposed to happen to those? <laughs> okay. Um, on one interpretation, the idea behind the systematic union is that it's just those common ends. We have a systematic union of those. In other words, the kingdom of ends is a kingdom in which we all treat every other member fully with respect. Okay, We treat them as ends in themselves, not as means only. And so the systematic union we're talking about is of these common ends. We all obey the same objective moral laws. And from that point of view, this is a kind of ideal where everybody is behaving morally. Everybody's treating everybody else with respect. He says, look, it's only an ideal, but nevertheless, it's important to think about that moral ideal. And in fact, John Rawls and Derek Parfit much later distinguish ideal from non-ideal theory. And the ideal would be, this is giving you a picture of the ideal theory. This is how we ought to behave ideally. Um, in Aquinas, this is how the angels treat each other. <laughs> and then, you know, in the real world where people are corrupt and they often do the wrong thing and people treat other people with disrespect and they make exceptions for themselves, well, then that's why we have to say this is only an ideal. But now, there's another interpretation of this because it depends what we think happens to the private ends. I'm supposed to take on your private ends as my own? Well, on a second interpretation, we say, oh, no, it's not those. It's the whole shebang. <laughs> it's all the common ends and the private ends. We're to view all of those as a systematic whole. In other words, in the end, we're all supposed to have the same ends. So actually, this is a rather misleading picture. I have to take on yours. You have to take on mine. In short, we must have a thoroughly systematic union of all ends. And the goal is to get all these people on the same page, seeking the same things with the same ends. Now, that interpretation can be pernicious if you write it large enough, right? This is behind Gleich Schultung. This is behind the idea that everyone's ends have to be aligned. Behind, in short, political correctness. We all have to think the same thoughts, want the same things, and so forth. Um, that's going to be hostile to things like free speech and freedom of thought and so on. But there's another way of taking it where you might say, look, um, go back to this. <laughs> I don't have to eliminate my private ends. I don't have to share all of yours completely. I just have to be supportive of them. Well, why am I talking about this at all in this course? Because actually, there's another way of taking this in the context of organizational ethics. And I think it's a very useful way. As members of an organization, you have common ends that go beyond these common ends you have as rational beings. That is to say, in an organization, you have these kinds of common ends as rational beings, but then you have another set of ends in common automatically as members of the organization. There really is a sort of systematic union of ends just by being a part of that company or that nonprofit agency or this university or whatever it is. You've got certain ends in common with everybody else here. And then, of course, you've got all these private ends on the outside. But you might say, yeah, in organizational ethics, we can give this another third interpretation, where really the idea is, imagine that we're all team players, <laughs> right? We're all valuing not just our own private ends, and not just the ends we all share as rational beings, but also the goals of the organization. Then we can say, ah, now I can say what these common obligations we have are. They're things that have to do with the goals of the organization. And insofar as those are moral goals, then these become moral obligations for us too. OK, well, next time we'll start with utilitarianism. You might have the sense that all of this sets boundaries on our behavior. But still, within a very large realm, it doesn't help me decide what to do. <laughs>